Hello and welcome to the Beekman New York Fine Jewelry Podcast with Stephen Webster, who needs no introduction, but I will just let you know that he has been called the crown hipster of jewelry. He's a member of the Order of the British Empire for his contribution to the British jewelry industry and to training in the industry. He's a pioneer of fair trade gold, and he has created rock star pieces for actual rock stars, including Elton John. He's created pieces for Madonna, for Elizabeth Taylor, for Nicolas Cage, for um, any number of fabulous and outgoing and outstanding celebrities that you can think of. We're going to get into all of that, but because it is Cinco de Mayo and happy Cinco de Mayo, he is going to give us a custom uh, cocktail mix, which I'm going to be putting up on the screen right now and he'll show you how he prepares it because you have an especially cool set of tools that I'll help you talk about so welcome thank you Sharon and uh, and um, hello everybody yeah I'm in my um, my lockdown space which is my kitchen and um, as you can see I've um, I've kind of created a, a dual purpose at my kitchen it's the no regrets bar as well and actually it's my my studio and and kitchen so it's got a lot of purposes right now so um in celebration to think of the matter we're gonna um, we're gonna make my um custom signature drink which is the black margarita and uh just in case you're wondering it's it's pretty much the same as every other margarita only i've got some uh, some black salt this is from ibiza it does come from different parts of the world so i'm gonna just kind of um while I'm working, I'm going to and talk through things. So, um, and I'm you using, can see his I'm, recipe here. Uh, I'm using my own tools, oh. which is kind of cool because, you know, when you're a jeweler, a silversmith, whatever, you, you know, design things for other people. And uh, rarely do you get the chance to, uh, to use your own equipment. And um, right now, I'm going to make three. So don't think I'm making a... As expect, uh, especially <laughs> <laughs> margaritas for myself. I've, I've got my family with me, of course, because yeah. this is the kitchen. So, uh, Hi! So we can, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the California version while you work. So mine is just tequila we've got, and limes. We've got the contro first, pouring it over ice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to go with the tequila. So we're going to tip over the tool now to the 50 milliliter size because we need a generous pour of tequila. Yep. As we know, celebrating uh, such a big, big occasion in Mexico and, of course, across America. So there we go. We've got three of those. We've put in our Cointro. We've got the ice in there. I'm going to just give it a shake up. Um, actually, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. I was thinking I left it on the app, but we're going to put the lime in later. So, yeah. uh, so that's that shaken. Now, this is my uh, special ingredient, which is the black salt, which, Lovely. Be, like I say, it's just salty, but it gives it a slightly different aesthetic to the yep. glass. So we're going to put the lime around there, grind that in. There we go. And there we got that. Gorge. And you can see that. Yep. yep, that's good. We're going to do that three times. There we go. And also, tequila is antimicrobial. So very important. It actually wards off virus. We need that right now. Yep, that's good for you. It's really a health beverage. You're probably wondering why I've got this massive glass. This is my wife's <laughs> own glasses. Uh, my my oh, head designer, cool. she decided when we went into homeware that she needed to understand how we engrave glass. Yeah. So she did it herself. And it is amazing. That's I mean, gorgeous. It's amazing. So, uh, yeah. It's now... Like, Stephen, if clients want to buy your barware, can they just contact you through the site? Of course, yes, we are. I want to say that the last few years, we kind of, I've been a jeweler for 45 years, so, you know, I kind of, I want to think I, I know my craft. And in my craft, when I was at college, you know, you, you, you I kind of learned to be a jeweler and a silversmith. Yep. And at the time, um, my tutor said, don't be a silversmith, be a jeweler, because, um, you know, silversmithing industry is, is kind of running out of steam. And he was really right, because we had, we had many, many years where um, 
you know, I think silverware in the home um, sort of lost its place, really. Mm. Formalities of, of being at home changed and, and people weren't so interested in, in the things that, you know, their parents had had in the home. Silver napkin rings and, you know, silver teapots, etc. So he, it was very good advice. But what's happened is that we, in the last... Cheers, uh, by the way. Cheers. Yeah, cheers, everyone. There we go. Cheers. There we go. To your health, other Websters. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I'll just have a quick slug. Yep. So, right, so I'm going to come sit down and um, get serious, if you like. So, um, there we go. I'm in my little cosy corner. Um, so, basically, the formalities of home changed. And, and I think, to be honest, in the sort of um, the latter part, if you like, of, of or no, not the latter part, the mid part of, of the, the 20th century, the Americans were big buyers of silverware, English silverware, they loved it. And then, you know, like I say, the formalities of life changed. And, and then, you know, once you haven't got a client, you don't, you, there's no point in producing uh, silverware anymore that's, you know, for, for another, you know, past generation. But I think what's happened is people are spending um, much more time in their homes. They're, they're taking more pride in their homes. And, and uh, if, if anything could be more appropriate than right now. <laughs> we need <laughs> we, we, cool barware. <laughs> Their homes, yeah. I think people are looking, looking into their home and, and uh, in a way that they probably haven't for the, for the last 50 years. So I think, you know, this is not as a, as a sort of a reaction to coronavirus. I think so, several years ago, I just thought, you know, the home seems like a place where, you know, people are taking, you know, uh, paying attention to their interiors. Their, their cooking has become a big thing back in home again. All the things that we kind of lost, all those mm -hmm. skills, they're coming back to the home. So I started with chef's knives, and it was quite maverick, to be quite honest. So it was like, I had no reason to do chef's knives. <laughs> I did the, the set of chef's knives called The Beasts, and uh, they were very, very much uh, inspired by my joy. And, um, and lo and behold, there was um a client for it and um that was the start of it so so we we kind of took it from there and migrated to the bar because the bar um it's an important part of the home lots of paraphernalia in a bar yeah you see you know there's lots of places where you can uh, apply um yourself if you're good with metal and, and really to be honest that's that's where my skill set lies but i i've um I've sort of expanded that now into glassware, etc. So, so that's that's the uh, the story of my my bar there. Yeah. And I'm sure lots of people at home who are watching this, if you've been thinking, oh, my glasses are a little bland, or I don't have anything fun to play with, yeah. take a look because these are super cool. Glasses are a little bland. You may want to think yeah. about these handy. Tequila tumblers. <laughs> That's exactly right. And uh, Deanna Vreeland said serpents should be on every finger, on all wrists, and everywhere. So you're you're right on. Um, what I'd love to do, because I think um, it is such a fascinating part of the process, is let's talk about some of the pieces on the Beekman site that you created. And if you'll just share how that process worked, if it started with a stone you found, or if it started with a, the design itself, I'll put your sketches up so we'll be talking to them. So the first one I would love to talk about is the thorn collar necklace. So this sketch is incredible. What year is this? What, what was the story behind it? Um. Well, okay, what we'll do, we'll, we'll go back to really the roots of uh, that kind of uh, thorn-inspired uh, collection, which, okay. which, which is probably 20-something years old. Okay. And it's, it, it's kind of interesting to go back there because 20-something years ago, <laughs> uh, diamond jewellery and fine jewellery, um, per se, was it wasn't edgy you know it, it was a lot of things it was beautiful it was classic it, it, it's um, you know an incredible use of materials it, it's not I'm not taking anything away from that but 
I was at, at the time, 20 years ago, I'd, I'd already been a jeweler for, for 25 years. And I think at that point, I was somehow trying to make, connect, if you like, the things that I uh, enjoyed and liked, the aesthetics that, that I surrounded myself with and my job, which was, was being a jeweler. And they didn't seem to me, you know, there was, it was just, you know, I was like my day job, I do this, I do, you know, the jewelry that I, you know, I love to do as a jeweler, but doesn't connect to my, to my, to my life. And, and so I was, I remember it extremely well because um, I was in Brazil and my wife was pregnant and um, she, she was laying out on a beach somewhere and I was a bit bored because I'm not a you know, I'm, I'm not very good on a beach, so I'm all right. Yeah. I've got to move around. And I start. I went up to my room and I, and I started to draw and I started to sort of look to an unusual place, which was tattoo inspired mm-hmm. imagery. And, and, it, and for some reason in Brazil, and I'm sure I could have found it in America or England, but it, I was in Brazil at the time, uh, I'm not finding all these these magazines and I'm looking through them and I'm thinking, wow, some of this stuff is really cool. It's kind of, it's one thing if it's on your skin, um, but, it, but it could also be called if, if I translate it into jewelry. So, so I started doing these drawings and I actually drew an armband. Um, wow. I was meticulously drawing it. I'm in the room, my wife's going, for God's sakes, we're in Brazil. We're only here for two weeks, come down and enjoy this. I think I'm on the verge of something. Uh, anyway, I, I drew this armband, and, th- and then I then I went down to uh, the beach, and she was laying there, like you know, really quite pregnant. Actually, probably about six months pregnant. And I, I said, "You've got to see what I was doing." So I, I drew. I had, I had my my uh, you know uh, pens and stuff, and I, I drew on her stomach. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually a very good canvas because it's quite tight. <laughs> and, I, and I put on it this sort of this thorn pattern. And, and she's like, okay, yeah, what is that? And I said, no, I think there's something in here. Anyway, look, to, to fast forward, I did a collection that um, I originally called the tattoo <laughs> because wow. I couldn't do anything else to do. And, and I think it, it, what it did, it, it sort of divided people in, into two camps. It was, it was the people who went, wow, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, because I was a fine jeweler and, I, and the only way I could translate that into a piece of jewelry was as fine jewelry. So I thought, well, how would this look if it was in diamonds? You know, diamonds are very glamorous and, yeah. and it's very edgy, this, this sort of uh, imagery and if I combine the two. And lo and behold, uh, yeah, it was very divisive. But what happened was the, the divide that went with me um, was very, very interesting. And um, I could see that there was real potential in, in this idea of, of sort of uh, making lifestyle, if you like, become part of, of what was my jewellery job. And um, that's, that's really led to the necklace you're talking about, which was uh, called Wild Rose. Wild Rose was 100%, um, you know, part of that era. And oh. the idea of making something that was actually quite couture, uh-huh. and beautifully made, you wore it in somewhat in a, it's difficult to say formal, but you weren't going to wear it shopping. You know, right. you were going to wear it it's, to an occasion. It's major, yeah. Yeah, it, it was occasion wear, which, um, you know, it's most fine jewellery is, is even worth sentiment or, you know, or occasion. And, and this was worn for occasion. And I think what happened was the people who were wearing it, the other people really noticed it. And, um, and that's really what you're looking for with a piece of jewellery. <laughs> well, people- this, is, this is the piece <laughs> on our site. <laughs> you all feel to go, oh, I didn't notice that. They go, wow, what is that? And, and so that led to that necklace and, and actually a period um, that changed the way I looked at jewelry. So that's the necklace when people say to me, I'm young, I'm fun, I don't want to dress like an old lady. 
I always say, if you want super elevated and handmade, but you still want to feel like you're cool or you're fun or you're kind of a rocker, go for Stephen Webster. And I think you still are the only jeweler who does such elevated work, but with a sense of humor and a twist and a fun lifestyle. So you're exactly right. No one's missing that piece. You look in, you see the sparkle at first, then you look and you say, is that a thorn? <laughs> So it leaves you wanting to know more about the wearer and about the piece. So you did not have a client in mind for this. You created the piece looking at Asya. <laughs> You're right. Yes, a pregnant Asya. But, but I think um, it didn't come from nowhere. Hmm. So it, that, that was where I, I really consciously sort of thought, I think I've got, um, you know, I've got more in this than just me doodling on my wife's pregnant stomach or me being up in the room, you know, when I should be out on the beach. I, I, I felt that there was something there that was going to be um, more than that. But you mentioned um, when you introduced me about Elizabeth Taylor, well, you know, in 1983, which really uh, yeah, puts me on the map a little bit of uh, my age, I, I was living in Santa Barbara and I was designing and making jewellery for a store um, that was owned by a guy that was a real rock hound. I mean, you know, this, this term rock hound, I think probably most people in America would, would kind of understand what that means, but in England, it didn't exist. And he was just incredible in his way. He would just travel the world and he'd go and sit with tribal people and, you know, remote parts and... And then he'd come back to Canada, which is where he was from, and, and bring a lot of specimens. And uh, he, 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 he came to London and he, he was looking for a jeweler. So I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm a jeweler. And he was offering a salary that looked extraordinary until I found out the Canadian dollar was worth about a third of the American dollar. But anyway, we, we talk about that later. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, when I went out there, and I was working, working with him, and um, through, through working with a guy who was so a character that you would never meet in, in the English jewelry industry in 1980. Because I actually went to work for him in 1980. So um, it was sort of a learning curve that was extraordinary for me. And, and through that, I, I sort of got exposed to very, very exotic uh, gems a lot of which I couldn't even say, let alone spell the names, like Savarite, Tanzarite, you know, and Kunzai, mm -hmm. God only knows how Kunzai spelled. But um, yeah, so, um, and, and um, we, we built a business in Canada, and, and then uh, after some time, um, I've been there three years, and uh, it snowed on my birthday, and my birthday is August the 13th, and I thought, well, if it, That's if wrong. it was August 13th, that's it. It's all, it's yeah. all over, isn't it? Really, yeah. So, so I moved back to London, and and I think he missed me or something because when when I moved back to London, he sold the business in Canada and and said, Look, I'm thinking of moving to Santa Barbara. Do you want to come back? We'll do it all again. And I thought, well, the one Better thing weather. you're not going to do in Santa Barbara is snow on my birthday. So absolutely true. I went back and uh, and did it all again. So so I I, I kind of now got this. Um, you know, my, my style, if you, if you want to call it that, and I, I'm in no way claiming now to be a jewelry designer. I just was given rocks that I had to work with and they were, they were big and bold and juicy. So my style became that way. Mm. And I made a ring that was um, at a big Chalcedony, which is a mm -hmm. lavender stone. It was 83, so it was a cabochon, mm -hmm. so a carbuncle, which was very much the style of the time. Mm -hmm. I think you probably will know, uh, like Bulgari, you know, and, and mm -hmm. such, were driving that look. Yep. And, um, and then I made, I designed the ring, I made it, and I hand engraved around the, the sort of bezel of, of this Chalcedony, a rose and thorn pattern in rose gold. So it had thorns and roses. So it was 1983, so that was way before the sort the of... Necklace. Test in uh, you know yeah. in, in uh, Brazil, so um, and and I get a call saying, "Oh, Elizabeth Taylor's just bought your ring." I was like, oh, "You've got to be kidding! You know that's ridiculous." Elizabeth Taylor's a famous woman. That's uh, awesome. And, uh, 
she bought the ring for herself and then and then commissioned a pair of earrings the bracelet so so right from that early day i'd had a little signature but but it it wasn't it wasn't something that i thought right this is now where i'm going it was just wow. what i felt like doing on a ring and, so and i i have to ask you more about elizabeth taylor so when she commissioned the additional pieces to what it, by that point she was one of the biggest jewelry collectors in the world she'd bought from all the major houses in the world particularly bulgari from the 60s but she was such a big collector how involved was she in the creative process? Did she leave it up to you? Did she have ideas in mind? I'd love to tell you that I sat with Liz, you know, for hours on end, and we, you know, we, we chewed the fat together. I believe you. Yeah, no, I'm not going to tell you that because that'd be a lie. Uh, she bought this ring, and um, actually, it's quite funny because if you think about 1983, I don't know. I know you can't. I'm going to date myself. I think she was with Larry and doing the Harley Davidson and the big hair, right? Well, whatever. But it's, there's like, a, you know, a, a world and a half ago. So um, when she bought the ring, and I, I, I said already, I'm like, you've got to be kidding. I, I thought, well, what do I do? What do I do? I phoned my mum, right? I phoned my mum. <laughs> I said, mum, you're never going to guess what, but that woman you really like, because <laughs> I knew my mum loved Elizabeth Taylor. My mum's from Wales, and Elizabeth Taylor, is, I think her roots are in Wales. And yep. She just bought, she went, don't be silly. I said, well, no, mum, she's bought this ring for me. So anyway, that was that. Uh, and, and, then, and then I think she just sort of wanted some earrings and a bracelet to go with it so okay. so i have no more story than that except for it's still a good story and it was my first brush if you like from celebrity. that's awesome but it so, was you know you think about it now you'd be on your social platforms oh, I, would, her, yeah. I would carry it tattooed on my arm look who bought from me <laughs> hi <laughs> You didn't have anyone else to find. I didn't even find a friend. Yeah. <laughs> so when you came up with the sketch, so you're in Brazil, did you already have the diamonds and the faceted quartz? Did you have in mind which stones you were going to use for it? Or did you go and then look for them? Uh, no, I, I think, so So what we're talking about now is the necklace you have on your side. We, yes. I love, by the way, I, I, it's a personal favorite. Um, which is a combination of this sort of very, very, very edgy, you know, diamonds, tattoo-inspired thorn diamond work. And then the, the, the gemstones in it are hematite and um, quartz crystal hazes, which, which I was sort of, I'd already developed by that time, because this is, this is 20 something years ago. And, Crystal Hayes this year, as we speak, is 25 years old. So, so oh. it was already kind of out there. And uh -huh. um, so what, what I would do with something like a Crystal Hayes, would I, I'd be sort of applying it where, where it felt appropriate. So, so that, that particular necklace I called the rose, the, the, um, the, the rose and crown. And it, and it was sort of a rose cut mm -hmm. gem. And so the quartz was rose cut, and underneath on that one, it happens to have hematite, and um, which, until you kind of put a piece of quartz <laughs> faceted over a piece of hematite, you have no idea that it's going to look so glamorous. Yeah. How can you? Because the two sort of separately, they're okay. They're okay, but, but nothing not like together. Yeah. Oh uh, wow, that's that's amazing. So so what it did, it gave me this kind of um, a look that no one else had because yeah. it definitely um, against white diamonds, uh, wow. extremely glamorous. It felt very chic. It felt very urban and and sophisticated. And and yet, you know, the parts, if you like. Uh, apart from the diamonds in, in, in the necklace, the parts were still on the fringes of fine jewellery mm -hmm. because, because it, they weren't really part of the, the repertoire that, that was, um, was in fine jewellery at the time.
And I do want to point out for the, the viewers and listeners, this is part of a grand tradition in high jewelry. So if you've noticed the Cartier Tutti Frutti bracelet that just sold at auction, those stones are not particularly valuable in and of themselves. It's about the work that elevates the stones. And in your case as well, it is a spectacularly elevated piece, I think for several reasons. The first is that nobody else can do the fusing of the quartz and the base material that you do. And I'll ask you later about it because it is exceptionally difficult. I tried messing around with uh, the quartz and I, it, mine was such a hot mess, I'm not even gonna show you. <laughs> Uh, but it is incredibly difficult to copy. So if you ask why you don't see it with others, it's because it's this is an example of being a bench jeweler and really understanding how to craft a piece and how to cut colored gemstones and how to work with other metal materials like a hematite, which is really difficult to work with as, as far as I understand it. But I think the next level is turning a very traditional notion, a diamond collar necklace, which makes me think of Wallace Simpson, but turning it on its ear and saying, how do I make this fun and young and really, really cool? But at the same time, it's that same level of high jewelry craftsmanship. So I think that combination is incredibly special. And as you said, nobody knows what the stone accents are because they are so unusual. So in addition to everybody staring at the necklace, they also lean in and what is that? Because it is no, just so beautiful. One second, I'm going to yeah. show you. This is how I buy hematites. Get out, really? No, 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 absolutely, 100%. Um, I buy it as, as basically a boulder. Wow. I shop for it in that way, which is uh, um, certainly, um, you know, 25 years ago it was, yeah. was unusual for a, for a jeweler, a designer jeweler to, to want to shop for the material that he was going to use in, in a way that was not from a gem box. I've got another yeah. piece here, which is a, a piece of um, Peruvian opal. opal. And, and um, you know, now I, I, I bought this. Uh, That's gorgeous. Not 20, but maybe 18 years ago. I bought an oil drum's worth of it from a Peruvian uh, miner uh, in Tucson, Arizona. That's which is awesome. Island. Gems, the Tucson Gem Show, and I and I think you know when when you see something like especially that that <laughs> I mean that's wild to envision getting to that high jewelry necklace from there is all the design that's incredible. Well, what it is is um, you know anyone who's been um, classically trained or or maybe not but has, has entered a, a space where they find that they they've got something to offer. You know, because I'm going to say there's two parts to to every kind of industry. And um, for me, I was classically trained, and you know, no one really was preparing me for for buying a piece of material that way. I, I mean, I was lucky that my my old boss in Canada, he was quite good at that. <laughs> he That's was, amazing. To be honest, he would never have looked at that piece of hematite. I wouldn't have interested him because he was looking for more like specimens and, mm. and things that had you know their own sort of intrinsic value if you like outside of the fact that you could use them in jewelry in an unconventional way and, right. and, and i'm like following him around and 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 i'm like whoa crikey you know you've just passed that you know why did you pass that that looks really cool and um i had no idea what what it would look like you know under a, a piece of quartz and but it felt like it was worth a shot, mm. partly because it was so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. You know, and you, you, you've got to think about, I mean, even today, um, but certainly then, you know, mm. if you were toying with the idea of, um, of, of sort of modifying, if you like, the cuts of sapphire, emerald, ruby, diamond, you know, we can get, we can go wider afield, opal, whatever. You gotta have deep pockets, you know. Yep. And and, and, I, and I, I didn't, and, but I, I thought, well, this stuff's cheap. I, put, I don't wanna to give too many trade secrets away, but this probably cost me about $10, right? It's just like, there's a lot of gems in there. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, 
what, what, what it did, it, it gave me a bit of material that I could play with mm -hmm. and get it wrong. And mostly yeah. I got it wrong. And, and I would buy things like lapis and turquoise. And um, at the time, uh, Chalcedony and Chrysoprase, both of which now are extremely wow. difficult to find. Yeah. At that, that time, we, we, you know, they were, they were affordable, especially if you bought them that way, you know, they were rough. So you're going to lose a bit. It's like buying, buying a fish on the bone. You know, you pay so much a pound, you buy it filleted, you pay four times. Right, there was labor. That yeah. is something with gems. And, and so it allowed me the chance to make mistakes. That's uh, really cool. And I, and I think that was sort of um, very, very um, sort of important part, if you like, of, of the development of Crystal Haze was that I, I felt like I had something. I was like mm. thinking, there's something in here that, that, that's kind of cool. You know, it's, mm. not, it's not out there. The technique is really old, but the technique, you know, as a doublet or a triplet, you know, with a, with a bit of quartz over the top of an opal, trying to make it look like it's a bigger opal was like mm -hmm. one thing. But I was going to make something that looked like it had a mystery within it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so I, I felt it was worth it. And, and, and sort of by budget and by just the fact that, you know, it, it was much more intriguing to me, I, I was using material that didn't cost a lot. So in the original collar necklace that we've put up, you do have the hematite and quartz faceted together. But by the time we get to the thorn cuff, which I now have up on the screen, you're using sapphires. So you've moved from the hematite and you've gone into what's considered the traditional big three of colored gemstones. Can you talk about when you choose to use the really, really expensive gems and what, what actually for this cuff, how did you get to the cuff and the choice of materials for it? Um, well, it, you know, by um, the fact that you've, you've sort of mentioned a sapphire, Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and it and it could equally be um, any one of the big four. Yep. You know the assumption, I suppose, is that you're using um, the top, you know, the top level of the material. But inevitably, there is a lot that's below that. And in fact, most corundum sapphire, yep, ruby, is not in that top gem quality material. Yep. There's a a bulk that's that's not and and uh, that's what I go for oh cool um you know certainly with ruby um I've used in the past a lot of of sort of African uh ruby that in no way is gem quality but it's ruby mm -hmm. ruby is ruby you know it, it's it, it carries some gravitas and um it just depends what you do with it and, you know, how creative you want to be with it. I mean, you know, I'm certainly not going to buy a, a big lump <laughs> of ruby uh, that, that's sort of in, it, in its mass, if you like. And it, it's, it's not gem quality. It's quite opaque, but it's got a beautiful raspberry colour to it. It's, it's yep. amazing. You know, you're not going to sort of cut a two carat stone out of that and try and pass it off as a, as a gem quality. You think, how else can I use it? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's ruby. It's amazing. And, um, and that's the way I look at it. So, so whatever I'm using, unless I've got a bespoke or, or I want to make a high jewelry piece, but I'm very capable of making a high jewelry piece. Yep. It's, I think my, you know, my sort of place, if you like, in, in fine jewellery is, is not so much about providing someone with a $50,000 ruby. It's about providing possibly a ruby in a way that the creative sort of um, aesthetic of it is probably the main reason that you buy it. And, mm -hmm. and not so much about just the intrinsic value, which mm -hmm. a lot of jewellery is. And... And as much as I get that, mm -hmm. it doesn't interest me creatively. Now, I want to skip ahead to one that is actually, I think, in that 
gem quality showstopper category from our collection, which is the yellow sapphire and diamond ring. Can you talk about your process with this one? Because this ring, everyone who's seen it just stops on a dime and stares into it. It's like looking into the sun. It's the most beautiful ring. Okay, so, I, so I'll go back on everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> I did it on purpose, it wasn't fair. You should have a sip of your drink because I'm ahead of you. <laughs> About that. I think I think you know we're now we're now sort of um, you know leapfrogging if you like from yep. uh, you know being uh, someone who, who's got a, uh, you know a huge respect and appreciation for all the materials that that are available to a fine jeweler. I mean yep. really, do. Um, and and where where I've chosen to apply my creativity in a way that's probably best suited to. Uh, the material that's that's not at that fine level. Mm -hmm. However, of course, I do, I do every now and again see a gem um, that speaks to me. I, it sounds like a cliche, but but it's true. And um, and then I want to work with it in a way that's different to everything I've just said. So I would be then looking at the stone, which is predominantly are going to be pre-cut. Mm -hmm. I may re-cut them because sometimes they're not cut to, um, you know, enhance the material to its best effect. So that that's by case by case. There's, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's nothing there that sort of says, this is the way I always approach it. Just look at a stone and think, okay, certainly with sapphires. With sapphires, uh, a lot of the time, sapphires are cut very, very deep. Yep. Because a lot of the colour is in the bottom of the crystal. So, you know, you said, well, I want this shallow. Where you cut it off, you go, shit, where did all the colour go? You go, well, yep. it was in the bottom. So you want that bit. But I, I think um, with, with certainly with something like that yellow sapphire, I mean, I was attracted to it as a stone. Um, I love fiery stones, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's yellow or orange or reds. Reds are my favourite. And it's yep. red, really notoriously difficult because you've even got ruby really expensive uh, or spinels really expensive <laughs> or if you find a garlic that holds its own you know when it's red and, and then i'm you know that. i love that but I, I think with that yellow sapphire um you know it, it's like it's, it's radiating you know mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful sunny it's like a sunflower and then what i would do with that which i did with this ring is as I think, how can I enhance it? So mm -hmm. my way of enhancing it was, I think I surrounded it with, uh, with diamonds in black gold. So it, mm -hmm. it sort of, you know, frames it. And then, and then I need to add Stephen Webster to it because otherwise it's just ordinary. And, and, that, and that was all about the work at the side. And yep. the work at the side is a combination of graduated, um, you know, uh, different colored sapphires, mostly yep. uh, oranges to, to yellows. Yep. Which you can see on the screen. Right, and some white stones. So, so it, it's it's a different process, but um, mainly with, with things like that, I, I would find an individual stone. Okay. And more often than not, I make a ring because I I feel that um, you know with the crystal haze in American Vogue in in twenty five years ago they. He said that I had reinvented the cocktail ring, and I was like, "Well, hey, that's great!" You know, pretty awesome. What more, what more can you ask? You know, uh, because the cocktail ring came with no baggage. I mean, no husband, yeah. boyfriend, nothing. Just cocktail ring. That's good. Uh, so I've always sort of kept that as my favourite piece of jewellery, and, and that I think is is a cocktail ring. So uh, yeah. Anything um, you want. Do you remember where you found the stone? Um. Oh God, no! <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to lie? No, I don't. I I can't remember where I found the stone because I tell you, I spend thirty percent of my week looking at stones. I'm yeah. even looking at rocks like this, right? Yeah. I'm looking at at something that's been cut. <laughs> you know, so um, I can't actually remember where I found that. So I'm so sorry if I've let you No, down. no. I, I think it's such an interesting part of the process, though, because you found this stone somewhere. How, how long could it be that you just, do you buy the stone immediately and you're already starting in on it? I've got to make this into a ring. Or could it sit with you for a while and then one day you pick it up and say, oh, this is the day? 
Well, uh, um, a very, very uh, accomplished jeweler, Wallace Chan. Uh, I, I had dinner with him uh, fairly recently, and mm -hmm. uh, he said to me that he can buy a, a rock and look at it for seven years. Well, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do tend to buy spontaneously mm -hmm. and then um, work on it when, when um, uh, just e either when time allows or, you know, the time feels right or, or I've got a request because mm -hmm. it's quite nice to have a little bit of an arsenal of yep. material, you know. People are, are fascinated by gems. I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of famous people and not famous people, and I, I've yet to find anybody that doesn't look at the, the gems I offer that mm -hmm. are you know, slightly out of the box or, or you know, just what a jeweler would offer. Gorgeous. Yeah, but uh, but I think that people are fascinated by them. So yeah. sometimes it, it gets picked, and, and they go. Oh my God, that's an amazing stuff. Will you design a ring for me? Mm. And that happened to me, you know, co consistently. So, so, like for example, right now we're locked in. We yep. are. The world is locked in. Yep. And um, the last event I went to prior to being locked in was the Tucson Gym Show. Me too. <laughs> where, <laughs> where I saw you exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And, and of course, I, I've been there since 1983. So, uh, in fact, I didn't go for a few years and they got worried and they phoned me up and said, can we pay for you to come? Back. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so I was, I was there and, um, you know, I did my usual. I, I kind of, I have a shopping list and, and sometimes it's a long one, sometimes it's a short one. And, but a lot of the times I want to use it as, uh, to sort of clear my head and, and, and just see what's there, you know, mm -hmm. and not be too predetermined by, by what I've got to get, you know, because yeah. I, I actually find that a little bit annoying, you know, it's yeah. like, sometimes it can be really exciting and other times just annoying that you, you, you've got this, you know, four or five days in this amazing place with all my friends and my rock hounds and, and everything and I've got to go look for a tanzanite somewhere. Right. I don't really want to do that. I want to find something that I wasn't expecting. So, um, you know, it, it's um, that's that's a place where where I would would go and and uh, find the unexpected or find what I'm looking for. Do you, you know? have anything from this last Tucson that you just got excited but you didn't plan for it? You know, it's interesting because um, my daughter now works with me and my daughter is um, uh, very creative and um, in, a, in, a, in a different space, meaning she's not a jeweler. She didn't mm -hmm. train to be a jeweler. She, she did graphic design and then went off to live in Berlin and, and you know, got into film editing and, and it's a completely different skill set. But... But obviously, quite the sort of visionary uh, uh, woman, and um, she was looking through our back catalogue or archive, I should say, and finding things there's no way I would have gone back to. Hmm. And some of them, uh, I think, we might even hit on a bit later with the Crystal Haze, like yeah. you know, 25 year anniversary. That that is because she said, Dad this is amazing and That's I know cool. I grew up with it um, but there's a generation out there who will love this and it's so you know in some ways it feels that the material you're using and um, the fact that the hero is not this sort of super expensive elitist mm -hmm. stone times right so so that that was through her bringing that up so so I went to Tucson this year and I didn't take her, but I, I said to her, this is the last time I'm going to come without you. Because I started to look for things that I thought, you know, she would like. And, and partly because of the things she'd sort of just thrown in there as, as like, I think she was looking at something I'd done in the 80s with a watermelon tourmaline. Now, oh, I haven't been dead watermelon tourmaline since the 80s, you know. Yeah. And, uh, 
I'll and, set that up. And then I'm in the, I'm in a, the, the excuse the sort of the, the pun, but I was in the Brazilian section. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there uh, is a section called Brazil. Uh, the Brazilian section. And, uh, and uh, I find these really wicked watermelon tomlies. And, and I, I swear I wouldn't have looked at them had she not said, this is amazing. And I'm, yeah. and, and then I have a, um, yeah, my head designer, Claire and I, we've worked for together for 17 years. And, uh, and you know, we, we think like one, we're peas in a mm -hmm. pod. And, you know, we have a, we have a, a junior design, designers who work under her and I. And mm -hmm. uh, Amy is joining the design team. Mm -hmm. Amy, and then Lucas is, is uh, her age, but a joint designer. So they, they, they okay. really kind of work, they look at things differently and they, and anyway, getting back to this. So I'm in Tucson. Now I'm looking at watermelon tunnelings, which I haven't looked at that site since, since the 80s. And actually I was getting really excited about them because I was like, wow, do you know what? They are amazing. Yeah. So I bought a bunch of watermelon tourmaline. And, uh, I love it. I spilled them onto her desk exactly the same as the guy used to do to me in Canada in 1980. Now it's your job because yeah, figure it I, out. I would not have bought those stones without her saying, this is amazing. And, and um, so, yeah, there you go. Full circle, I guess. I mean, you know, they're, they're never going to be um, an emerald, a ruby, a sapphire, etc. But they're fascinating they come out of the ground in some ways. I completely get why a twenty-something-year-old might look at it and go, "Oh my God, I've never seen anything like that before." You know, I'm, I'm old in the tooth, and uh, I've seen it all. Bit well, I've seen it all before as far as gems go, but but um, it's been really, uh, you know, refreshing. I think, and, and me to um, just be looking at something for my daughter to work with. And, and that's exactly actually what we're seeing with Beekman is we also have a much younger borrower and they are looking for pieces that feel cooler and more youthful and a little more fun, which is why your jewelry speaks directly to them in a way that I think isn't necessarily what we associate with the other high jewelry houses. That's really your special position that you occupy, which brings me to the Jules Verne collection. So um, can we talk about broadly the inspiration, but then we're going to talk about the shark jaw, the hematite earring, and we'll talk about the lapis and quartz ring. So mm -hmm. what inspired Jules Verne and what year are we at? Because the, the drawings from Jules Verne are mind boggling. Well, uh, Jules Verne was uh, another very selfish collection. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wrote a book several years ago. I wrote it myself. I didn't have a ghostwriter. I wrote it all, and it's called Goldstruck. And and it's not, it's not an autobiography. God knows, no one want to read an autobiography of Bastien Webster. But but it's sort of about my journey in jewelry, and and I've tried to make it, you know, um, an enjoyable read. Yeah, you know, as much as much as the fact that it's led to, you know, what I am as a jeweler, mm -hmm. and and I think you know. I, I'm, I'm sitting here and it's dark outside, right? So uh, I appreciate you're going to have to trust me on this one. But out that window is the English Channel and then um, France. Yeah. So we're, we're at the closest point to France here. And, um, in Kent. In Kent. And I, I call my house Hellfire Cottage because in the war, <laughs> this was called Hellfire Corner because... Um, the, the Germans, uh, the, big, the biggest guns the Allied forces had uh, were here. And they, they yeah. could reach France, so they could reach 20 miles away. So the Germans just wanted to get rid of the guns. So they bombed <laughs> the shit out of this little village. <laughs> it's a village. I mean, I'm not joking, it's a village. And, um, but it's called Hellfire Corner because of that reason. Wow. So, um, yeah, we, we kind of, um, by the sea, Mm -hmm. And um, I love I love being by the sea. I, uh, I I refer to my years in Canada where it snowed on my birthday, but that wasn't the only reason I left. I got very very depressed, actually really depressed, clinically depressed, because I was six hundred miles from the sea. And, you need and I, water. I, yeah, I, I need I need it. And 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 as soon 
as I returned to England, um, I bought a very, very modest little tiny fisherman's cottage by the sea because I knew I needed to be there. And it, and it really helped me uh, with my sort of therapy, if you like, yeah. <laughs> of getting over. No, as, you know, as a Californian, uh, I've got you. Same uh, problem. California, see, California worked because kind of, I live in Santa Barbara's by the sea. You see the water, yeah. I need, I need to be by the sea, and um, I really do need to be by the sea, and I'm very, very lucky, I, I, I have to say, that I wake up in the morning and I look out to sea, and so something like Jules Verne, um, it's got two, two sides, um, one, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, mm -hmm. a Jules Verne classic. I probably read when I was about 12, mm -hmm. and... I've got that book. I've got. I've still got the book. It's, it's, it's like you know. It's just about there. Yeah. And um, that idea of a fantasy under the sea, and uh, you know, a world. Not you know, not the moon, but under the sea. You know, and yeah. and, uh, and then the fact that I spent my whole childhood uh, rooting around rock pools, and and then both my very sort of. Uh, uh, sophisticated daughters um, who uh, I used to drag them to a rock pool and, and actually Amy the daughter who works with me god she was so fast she could catch a fish with her hands uh, which was amazing so so we've got it in our DNA and, yep. and I wanted to sort of a bit like the lifestyle the rock and roll doesn't matter what wanted to combine it with my jewellery so I came out with Jules Verne and uh, and to be honest, I never forget because uh, the, the jewelry buyer from um, Nima Marcus at the time, he said, okay, I don't think anyone is going to want to buy a shrimp earring. <laughs> and I said, Eric, it's a prawn earring. Have you never seen the picture, the girl with the prawn earring? Anyway, uh, yeah. So um, um, what happened was it... It became a huge success. <laughs> yeah. What year are we at? Uh, we are, we're in 2005, uh, six, I don't know, something like that. And, and at the time, I, my market, I mean, I built my business in America. Yep. In America. I mean, America embraced me like England never did. And um, it's my second home. Well, you and, opened the same year as Guns N' Roses, I think. So you were like right in line with what everybody was wanting. Well, anyway, so so I've um, I've got I've got, so I built my business in America, and and that was um, from ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven. That they were the rocking years when Neiman's yep. Bergdorf. I was probably number two or three of their whole designer. I can't even believe it. You know, it's crazy. Uh, and then. Um, at the same time, you know, Assi and my wife's Russian and the Russians were kind of coming, you know, and mm. like, if you like your jewelry, Mr. Webster. <laughs> so we, we, um, we took off in Russia and uh, at the time, Christina Aguilera, who had been a fan, an amazing client of mine, mm -hmm. amazing in, and she became a friend and I think anyone who knows me would not dispute it she was there for us I mean you know when we did the Vegas show one year and she did a concert for Stephen Webster even David German went all right I don't wow. know how Bobby said that was extraordinary and, cool. um, and so she's now my face and my brand I've yeah. got George Burn out and we did an ad with her, she's, she's like this. Uh, she's got amazing eyes, blue eyes. And she's yep. got one blue eye, bleach white blonde hair. And on this hand, she's wearing the crab ring. Yep. It's a crab for Christ's sakes. I love and, it. Uh, I remember going to uh, Kiev mm -hmm. and, uh, with her, actually. It wow. was a crazy experience. And every single billboard in Kiev, which is the capital of the Ukraine, for yeah. those of you, every single billboard was Stephen Webster, Christine Aguilera with the crab ring. Whoa. <laughs> we couldn't make enough crabs. I mean, it was ridiculous. 
You do not make a crab ring thinking this looks like it's going to be a money spinner. It's a crab. And, and uh, it became a sort of a joke because it was a club. All these yeah. women, they're walking around with their crab ring. crabs. <laughs> and and um, I, lo I, I, I love that story more than almost any other because it's so bonkers. Yeah. Well, it just goes to show you that you can't let someone else tell you what ought to be made. You worked from your inspiration and it took off because it's cool. And I'm putting up the shark jaw. Can you talk about this pendant? So how far along in Jules Verne were you when you started this sketch? Uh, it was all at the same time. We, okay. We, we were in the middle of a seafood buffet. <laughs> Yeah. So this is lifelike? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, I, I can expand on that a little bit. So uh, just before I got to the shark jaw, I, I was on a crustacean high with the crab, right? So I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't go wrong. You know, no. I've, got, I've got shrimps and crabs. I've got <laughs> I thought, well, people like crab, but they love lobsters. So we, we, that was when we introduced the lobster ring, we, which never sold as well as the crab, but... It was worth a shot. It looked good in the showcase because now we're looking like the, the we're looking like Harrods seafood mm -hmm. counter. You know, we've got shark's jaws, we got All out. we got crab rings, we got lobster rings, we got everything you could ever imagine. In fact, we didn't even sell anything on a Monday because all fish shops close on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you're planning a collection, do you have a number of pieces in mind? So I'm gonna have this many pendants, this many earrings, this many bracelets, or do you just sort of work from inspiration and see where you end? Well, I'm so sorry, I've got a mouthful of black salt. Um, As one does, it is Cinco de Mayo. Well, this is where I start to abrade with my, um, with my merchandise into him because <laughs> <laughs> apparently they think there's a limit to the rock <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, whereas I just want to fill it full of everything from my childhood, they, um, sure. but you know what? Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Um, because um, I made a brooch out of titanium that's um, kind of extraordinary. Um, it, it's partly extraordinary, it's part Jules Verne. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than make it in conventionally, I, I, I kind of, there, it was, uh, oh blimey, it was like to, you know, 12, 15 years ago. I, I, I'd, um, people were talking about titanium mm -hmm. in, in context of, of fine jewellery and, and Jar was probably very, very instrumental in, in introducing that as a, as a medium and, and I'm like, right, okay, I like the idea of that because he, he was making really big volume pieces that were light and wearable because they were made in titanium. And so we, um, we had this, this pin that was, um, I love pins by the way, pins, same. The cocktail rings because they serve no purpose. Right? <laughs> and um, that, they don't have to work on your ears or you know, on my. Pillow. And they're non binary. Man, <laughs> woman, however you define yourself, throw one on. And then tiaras. Well, yeah. So, um, so I made this pin, and, and the, the, the perfect um, uh, medium to work in was titanium because I wanted it to be big. Uh, it was this Japanese fighting fish, and, and they needed to. I call it the wolves mm -hmm. of Japanese fighting fish, and uh, they are waltzing around each other. Anyway, I had no idea how complicated titanium was to work with, and I and I, I know for a fact that um, jar aside, nobody can handle it. One of the most um, progressively sculptural pieces of jewellery in titanium because it's in the V&A Museum. So the, v the Victorian Albert Museum in London, you know, it's in their permanent collection. 
as an example of using the material in a way that was not being used before because it, it's, it's, it's notoriously difficult to work with. So, um, you know, in, in that period, I, I, I feel that despite, you know, the first reaction being that, uh, you know, who's gonna wanna wear anything out of a rock pool? We proved that wrong with the crab ring, and then and then um, uh, you know we went on to the fighting fish, and that's in the DNA. And then to answer your question, I th I think I was probably pushing it by now. I'm thinking, right, how far can I go with this? I know I'm going to go with the shark jaw. No one's going to want to wear a shark's jaw, <laughs> and uh, and of course the shark's jaw bracelet. Well, uh, it would just be. Be, became another icon. Yeah. We, partly, I was having so much fun with with what we were doing by then. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't about sort of you know irony or anything. It was like, how far can I go enjoying myself as a creative jeweler that I've still got an audience? Mm -hmm. and, and I think this was the thing that was he just kept time after time you know proving that there was an audience there was a there was a client there was someone who wanted to wear jewelry in a way you know it wasn't so much about saying oh i i um can only wear this at a certain time i think right. you could, it was still glamorous but it was glamorous in a completely different way it was glamorous okay. it was quirky it was always beautifully made. I yeah. mean, I, one of my, you know, pillars of, of my brand is, you know, jewelry by nature. It's high jewelry. Generally small, apart from my fine fish brooch and stuff, generally small and, and, and expensive. So therefore it should be beautifully made because that goes back to my roots as, as a jeweler. So I think all those things, you know, need to be, you know, those boxes. Off. But then as a, as a design and creatively, it can be whatever you want. And, mm. and I think that period and leading up to that period and since that period have kind of proven to me that there, that, you know, as far as creativity, the boundaries of creativity and of, of uh, a free spirit and enjoyment and all the things that jewelry should also be, are out there, there is a client for it. It's just that it needs a designer to say, oh, there you go, that's my version of it. And, and to be honest, the shark jaw is right there. Yeah. It's a shark jaw. And you can't miss when you look at it, oh, that's Stephen Webster. So it's not just a shark jaw, you know you're looking at Stephen Webster's shark jaw, which I think is also part of what makes it sell. For the hematite Jules Verne earrings, did they come as part of a request from clients for give me cool earrings to wear? Were you thinking about them as a function or did they just kind of come out of the creative process of being 20,000 leagues under the sea? Yeah, no, 100% out of the creative process. We had no client asking for that until we offered it to them. And the, that, those earrings and the ring and bracelet that went with it, yeah. and actually the necklace as well, but we didn't make that many of the necklaces. We made a lot of the, well, a lot, a lot in my world, so not that many, but anyway, uh, we made uh, a few. <laughs> um, the bracelets, um, I think the bracelet actually is very interesting because the bracelet and ring, which were the two most popular parts of the series, um, were again very edgy mm -hmm. uh, complex really complex from a manufacturing point of view and i i think you know when we we're talking about those earrings there you're looking at something that could be considered to be a conservative way of wearing an earring because it's right there it's clipped on your ear it's it's you know it's not doing anything you know asymmetric or you know whatever you want to say but actually it's not conservative. At all. It's, it's actually really intriguing. And, yeah. um, and I think um, 
that was probably what was the most unique point. And, and underneath, so underneath that sort of vertebrae of, of something that's come from under the, the seabed, uh, sorry, the, uh, the water line, is this crystal haze, which, which is what gives you that now another depth of, uh, of intrigue. So for something like that, how long would that would those earrings take to make from start to finish? So you start with your chunk of hematite that you showed us. You're making the crystal haze. You're making the vertebrae of the white gold, I believe, for our pair. How long do you think from start to finish would it take to manufacture? I mean, um, for, for once you're sort of up and running yep. you've planned out the complications which honestly with that pair of earrings i don't even know if i've ever ironed them out to be honest it's, they're quite complicated but um you know you might be looking at three to four days of straight work so yep. i give the stone cutter the quartz, I give him the hematite. He knows what he's doing, da da da. I give the, the, uh, that stone then to the jeweler. He knows what he's doing. So they, you know, and then the diamond set up because they're set with diamonds. So you sort of go through this process, uh, the engineering, the, but, but if I look at it uh, a little bit more sort of um, broader than that, because nothing is. Right. The, the, the work to get to that line was a lot. How did you get to that Volkswagen? You go, well, okay, before I got to the Volkswagen, I did all this. Um, I think it's, um, it's quite complicated. I, I, I'm sure every jeweler will, will tell you the same thing. And I don't know if we're that good at actually um, sort of um, calculating the, the thought process to you know, this sort of, um, where I sit down with Claire, my head designer, who I've said as well, me 17 years ago, right, we're going to go to Jules Verne, 20,000 leads, she'll go, okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and then, and then, I, and then I've, I swear blind, she's an amazing person and, uh, and one of the greatest jewelry designers I've ever, ever, ever worked with. And, but she needs for me to come with a story, you know, because it's Stephen Webster is right. Where we start. So I've got to start with that. And then I, then I, you know, think about things quite a bit. And then, then I go to her and say, this is where we're going. And, and then we start, we, what, what we usually do is we, we all come down here. Mm -hmm. So this Kent, as we know, by the coast, we get out of London. I don't want any noise. I want to stop the noise, which at the moment we've stopped all the noise all over the world. But Claire and I have said last week or the week before, we said, my God, we're turning out some of our most creative work. Wow. Uh, well, because there's nothing else. Mm. You know, I mean, there, there's nothing else. It's, the noise has stopped. And, and the reason why I bring her and my design team here for a week in the summer. It's not like we sit here and design everything for a year, but we really focus only uh, on where we're going. Amazing. And I think we've done that for year on year and everyone loves it because we do it in June, it's a week by the seaside. And, but you, you know, there is no denying that you need to create um, a space with no noise to be mm -hmm. the most creative you can be. There are absolutely those moments where you wake up in the middle of the night, you look at something, you do all these things that lead, but, but you know, we're, we're, we're sort of, we have to follow a cycle. Mm. And, and, and I'm, thank God we're not in the fashion industry because that cycle is crazy. Painful. And yeah. Crazy. But, but we are in a cycle and, and, you know, every year we show a couture, we show, a, you know, we do, we have to, we have to, we've got to bring newness to these uh, places. They're poignant moment, moments in, in the calendar. And, um, and so therefore, you know, there is, there's a schedule and you've got to be by it. So we find that coming down here for the week 
in June, which fit in nicely. It's just after Vegas. We've had a bit of feedback from the year previously. And then, and then I've already been thinking about, you know, where we might be going. Mm -hmm. um, and that starts in that year again of, of uh, creativity. So I want to move on to another collection with this sketch that I think is just spectacular from the Lady Stardust collection. So can you showed us that that specimen of opal, and I'm assuming the pink opal in the necklace is from that that big case that you bought. In that oil drum, you are oil well, drum. Can you talk about where does Lady Stardust come from? Well, I um, we are. We are really uh, going back to, I think, um, a time when, when in 1972, <laughs> good God, um, I was watching television and there was a guy called David Bowie and Mick Ronson, who I'm looking over your shoulder yeah. in my kitchen and I've got the most amazing photograph by Mick Rock. Who's oh, a cool! Photographer of David Bowie and Mick Wilson, and they're both dressed to the nines, um, and having like what looks like a roast lunch on a train going somewhere. And anyway, the, it, I'm, I'm watching Top of the Pops, which is you know kind of a, a bit like Soul Train or something in America. Yeah. And his, his character comes on. He's like, I couldn't work out if he was a boy or a girl. I had no idea, and they, they performed Starman, and Starman was like nothing we'd ever heard in rock and roll. It was nothing. It was, it was totally came out of somewhere, you know, and um, I thought, that guy doesn't work in an office. Nope. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I just, 1972, so I was 13. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I knew that I wanted to go to art school because I knew enough, that was it, just enough to know that um, guys like David Bowie probably went to art school. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, I, um, when I was 15, um, I went for an interview at art school and, uh, and I got in. And, um, wow. and fashion designer was amazing. I was like, I loved fashion and I could draw. Anyway, I got in. Clearly. And at the time, I went back home and I said to my mum and dad, who were amazing, um, you know, sort of, um, they were just very tolerant people and, and uh, I think very supportive, uh, way ahead of their time because to my friends, if they'd said, I've just gone to art school, I'd probably got a clip around the ear and said, just stop fantasizing, get back down to the yards. Anyway, I, um, I went to art school as a fashion designer, but my, my sort of first day there, the head tutor came to meet me and he, he was, I think we can say now, he was a, an extremely flamboyant gay person. And in 19, this was 1976, and I hadn't really encountered and it's, I was at an all boys school in Gravesend, which is quite a hardcore sort of end of London, uh, down the Thames Estuary, where Pocahontas died. I mean, you wow. know, well, I don't blame her, to be honest. Anyway. <laughs> so basically the opposite of art school. If you're gonna go, you might as well go at Gravesend. And um, I thought, oh my God, I don't know if this is for me, because he showed me into the, he was already really, you know, like, um, almost like a drag queen. And, um, and uh, he showed me into the room and it was the girls and sewing machines. And I was like, oh Jesus, I've, I've not thought this through at all. And I was having a bit of a, you know, a moment. And, um, but fortunately, the, the, um, the principal said, look, I was, I mean, I was 16, you know, I was like just a kid. And he said, look, you can have a look around the college and, 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 and there I discovered jewelry. And um, the jewellery room was phenomenal to me. It was, um, it was full of smells and flames and noise and... Uh, Rocks. And, you know, a brutality 
which was not evident in the design of the fashion design room, that's for sure, you know. So uh, I thought, I, I, this looks amazing, you know. And, and I was able to transfer to that and, and I never looked back. So going back to David Bowie yeah. and... Uh, so from 72. Lady Stardust, the reason I went to art school. And I've done a lot of rock and roll jewelry. Yep. And I've sold a lot of jewelry to rock stars. Yep. I mean, you know, uh, Rocket Man, which came out last year with Elton John, you know, in it, in it, the young Elton John is wearing yeah. one, of, one of my rings, you know, and Ozzy and G with so many rock stars. But uh, David Bowie was my guy. Mm. And, um, and I never, I never was able to really feel like I could um, interpret that influence on my life without it feeling like cheesy or mm. just right. Mm. Anyway, I, um, in one of my moments, um, I wanted to uh, design a collection about being British and, and it was nothing to do with being, you know, this was not about nationalistic or bollocks, you know, it's about what does it mean to be British and, and I'd been will, uh, reading quite a bit of William Blake uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and living on the White Cliffs and, and uh, William Blake did an incredible poem called Albion which was about about the white cliffs of Dover and these sort of giants that came out of the sea. And so it was really about being British. And, uh, and to me, uh, David Bowie could not have been from any other place. He could only be from Britain. And so it led to Lady Stardust, which is dependent on you. I'm so sorry that I gave you such a long wind. No, I love it. But I think it shows that it came from somewhere. Yeah, uh, and, oh, it's cool. And so um, it, it's been a collection that's a, a bit like Jules Verne and some of the others, it's still there. We still mm -hmm. say it. It it's resonates with people. I think they, um, they may or may not um, be a fan of David Bowie, it doesn't matter. But, I, but they get it. Once they, once they understand, they get it. They get where it's, where it's from and why it's called Lady Stardust. And, and so that's it. So I'm glad you mentioned about being British. Did you, did you know the MBE was coming? Uh, well, no, not till I got a letter from the Queen. Well, actually, you get a letter from the Prime Minister. Okay. Who, who was Queen, the Prime Minister at the time? David Cameron. He okay. said that the Queen has asked me to write. <laughs> To you, which is let's face it, it's quite a funny letter to get. Awesome it? though. Yeah, and um, I am I'm very proud of that because yeah. um, it was, to be honest, it was much more about my involvement with um, the next generation of jewellers mm -hmm. than, than my services to the jewellery industry. I would never have got it for that. It, it was because. I created um, uh, Rock Vault, which, mm -hmm. which was a platform which um, has now proved to have been very, very successful uh, because of the people who have come through it. And I think I'm no way claiming any responsibility for the creativity of the people who have come through it, but I was able to pass on um, my experience, of which is immense. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it's, it's important to, to celebrate the training effort that you've undertaken because entering the jewelry industry at the high jewelry level can be incredibly intimidating where to start. And Rock Vault, your effort, was a direct way for young designers to become involved and to get trained and to be supported and mentored. So I do think that's a very important contribution, which brings me to the fair trade gold. 
So can you talk a bit about how you got involved with Fair Trade Gold? Because I've told this um, in the podcast before, we have very few living designers on the site because we're committed to sustainability. And the only easy way to be sustainable with high jewelry is to recirculate existing pieces, which is what we do with most of the houses. But in your case, you are so careful with your sourcing and with your chain that it was easy to verify. So would you mind talking a bit about Fair Trade Gold and how you came to it? Uh, yeah, um, it was probably about um, 10, oh, no, 15 years ago. Um, I think somebody came to me and said, they, they basically introduced me to the fact that there was people mining gold who are earning a dollar a day and, um, and that I should probably be aware of that. And, and I think... Uh, I was instantly, I wanted to know more. Yep. I didn't dismiss the person. I wanted to know more because it was a, the zeitgeist at the time in the industry was very much about, you know, blood diamonds and, and you know, this sort of opaqueness that, that seemed to surround the industry that I only knew. I, yep. I didn't know the other industry. And, and I think... Um, you know, during that period with, with this whole sort of, um, uh, you know, introduction of, of the term blood diamonds, which I, I think the first time I heard it, um, I had no idea what it meant, which probably most people had no idea. No. And, um, you know, and, and I wanted to distance myself from the, the, uh, the possibility that somehow my diamonds were coming to a, uh, the market in an unethical way, but but I didn't really I wasn't equipped entirely to know if I could sort of be you know uh, I I I the idea of it I, was abhorrent, but how I could guarantee to my clients that my diamonds were not coming to the market in that way I had no idea. Right. I had to find out and, and, and at the time I went on to a BBC radio as you know BBC is very much you know they they want to they want to dig in deep and um, and it was a very very uncomfortable experience I was with a very very good friend of mine Carol Walton who was the jewelry editor of Vogue for 20 years and we went we literally went on the program because of trying to understand what that meant exactly and um, how we could distance ourselves from it. But BBC being the BBC made us feel very uncomfortable to even be in our industry. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I didn't, I didn't have an answer for that because how could I? I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm a jeweler. I mean, yes, I, I use diamonds. I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking for blood diamonds. I'm not looking for what it means, you know, I'm, I'm, and, and so I, I think it kind of started something in the industry, which the industry needed to do, which a lot of industries still need to do, including Agreed. your industry, look inside themselves and understand their supply chains and, you know, any areas that are opaque, etc. So it, it was, it was that kind of time. And, and, and then I think, um, someone had, had come to me and said, um, you know, I'm, I've, got, I've got an ethical uh, gold supply. And I said, okay, I'm interested. <laughs> because, yeah. and, and then it proved to be ineffectual. I mean, it was like, I don't know, the guy had a backpack and he went somewhere and came back about a year later with that much gold. I mean, well, okay, that's like, what are we going to do about the rest of it? You know? <laughs> and so... Um, I didn't really know where to, to go with it. And then I was approached uh, again by a Dutch NGO. Um, and they said, look, we, we, um, we understand that you might be interested in, in pursuing a more responsible um, you know, sourcing of your material. We, we're from Solidaridad, which, which sounded like something. Right. <laughs> A left-wing organization. <laughs> as, right. as someone who grew up in Berkeley, I have a totally different association with that. 
Anyway, they, they, in their very Dutch way, which is quite convincing, they said, look, we, we are the exploratory arm for fair trade. So we all, at the time, you know, this was now probably about 10, 11 years ago, um, we all know what fair trade coffee means, fair trade bananas, fair trade cotton. Fair trade gold needs to, get, it needs to go through a process. And the process is that this Solidaridad, this NGO needs to sort of go out there. It needs to uh, apply the, the criteria to, to um, a situation, in this case, mining. And once the, the community adopts the criteria and can be sort of policed, if you like, by fair trade, yep. they can reach fair trade status. So yep. I went, I went, I flew to Peru, I went with my brother, I, I drove to basically what was like hell, I'm not mm. joking, like hell. It was just the most barren, awful, terrible place. It was, um, there was pits of mercury. Ravages wood. of mining. Around. It, was, it was so awful. And um, I went down the mines, uh, which, was, which was frightening. I'm not trying to be a martyr here. It was really frightening. In fact, at one point, the, the, the roof started to cave in and my brother ah. <laughs> out of here. He will thank me for that. <laughs> And but I, he left you. Nice. I in. Yeah, I went all the way in, and, and then <laughs> when, I got to the, when I got to the kind of the uh, the the, uh, the business ends, the coal face, if you like, yep. and he's got the hammering in. I mean, hammering in dynamite, and they kind of stand back and go, <laughs> the wow. comes out, and then the donkey takes. The, 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 I'm like, all right, I am at the bedrock of the jewelry industry. Yeah. And, the guys down in the miners, the, the miners are like, why are you here? I mean, they're speaking in Spanish, and, I, and then the interpreter, and, and then they're hugging me, they're shaking yeah. my hand. They never had a jeweler go in there, and they, what, they it was like, why would you come here? And I said, well, because I've got an inquiry in mind. I don't know, I, I want to go back, and I, I, wanna, I want, if I'm going to talk about fair trade, I've got to understand what that means, the difference it makes to your lives and everything. And, and I saw the difference it made to their lives. And it really emotionally affected me hugely. And I wrote a diary and it was published in The Guardian. And, um, you know, it was early days. It was very early days. And, and um, I'm glad I did it. And, yeah. and now, you know, finally, fortunately, the world is looking at these things. Catching up. Taking them into account. And I can't say that I didn't enjoy my adventure. It was an adventure. And uh, that I was able to do it at that time. You know, and that's kind of it, really. And I, I do want to reiterate that if you are looking to buy high jewelry, that's a, a newly created piece with comfort and certainty about the sustainability of the piece you can buy from Stephen Webster because everything has been vetted. Um, and now that brings me to another aspect of your work that I think is fascinating and hopefully will be of interest to listeners right now, which is that you repurpose jewelry. So I get asked a lot, you know, do you want to buy this thing that I have at home that I don't wear? And we don't buy directly from individuals. But one thing you do, which I think is an amazing service, is that if a client has a piece at home that they're not using, they can do a virtual consult with you and you'll redesign around the stone or stones and make it into something much more fantastic. So how, how does that process work? Can they just write into you on the site and book an appointment? Uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> I mean, not not that many people do, to, to be honest. No, they really should. It's an amazing service. I, th I think when, um, you know, again, uh, Amy, my daughter and I, you know, we, we sort of, um, we thought that this sort of really, really traditional service that a jeweler offers, it's so, it's so basic, you know, it's like... Yeah. You know, can you redesign my ring? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very basic. But to take it to another level, we thought, well, yeah. you know, everybody's got 
this sort of jewelry box and they really yeah. do the minute you start talking about it, they go, oh yeah, I've got that my jewelry box here. Good jewelry box. And, and then they don't know what to do with it. They have no idea what to do with it. And you yeah. say, well, what about if, you know, you bring it not, not, and I have to be careful here because I'm, I'm not belittling the local jeweler because the local jeweler serves uh, a fantastic uh, purpose. But I think to bring it to sort of a, you know, an, a recognized designer mm -hmm. and, and Look at look at it and, and say, well, what what do you need? Yeah. From your jewelry right now, are you looking for, you know, something that you wear every day, something you wear for occasion, something that oh God knows, you know, marks an occasion in your life. All the things that jewelry do. Yeah. And go, wow. Oh, okay. You you can you can uh, do that from what I've got. And I go, yeah, that's the boy you got. Then you know, honestly, it's actually really easy for me to, to do that um, because I spent my whole life looking at jewelry. You know, and we've had some brilliant, brilliant. The, the greatest thing is is literally that consultation because they're yeah. nearly all that's funny. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> I have no idea why. I mean, one of the first women that came in, we did this night, and I think my my sort of marketing team. Quite rightly, you're quite discreet, you know. They were like, Well, should we have these private consultations? And I said, No, no, we're gonna have drinks and we're gonna have like you know, canapes and whatever. Come on. You can bring in this shit, put it all on the table, and let everyone look. Yeah, but people might not want other people. I said, I don't think it's that private, I think it's gonna be the more the merrier. Yeah, that's cool, and sure enough. This, what, the first woman who comes in, she says, look, I've got this ring. It's got three diamonds in it. I said, I, I thought my husband and I were going to have three kids. And then a fourth one comes along. And the fourth one is really aware of the fact that this ring has all three births other than the fourth one. <laughs> so, uh, so what do we do with it? And so, I, I, and so the, the first three were girls and the last one was a boy. So we, we made her a pair of earrings. One said, boy. Oh. <laughs> had a, so uh, good. Yeah, I had a awesome. But it, it, you know what? It makes everybody smile. Yeah. She would ne never have, in, in her wildest dreams, have come up with that was the way she was going to make this thing work for now the four kids. And, and I think that's all what it's about, really. And again, just to repeat, you can get a consult with Stephen Webster, just write into them on their website. So if you've said to yourself, I inherited this piece, it's not my style, or I just don't wear this, it's sitting in my jewel box, you can repurpose it with him into something fantastic. And that actually brings me to Mother's Day, which is in the US, five days from our recording, but in France, it's next month. And I think it's, it's also worth pointing out that one way to make this fantastic for the mothers in your life, be it your siblings, your, your actual mother, grandmother, aunt, whatever, is you could repurpose for her. So give her a gift. Just say, you know, you'll have a consult with Stephen Webster. Bring in something you already have because jewelry can be, you know, obviously very personal. But if there's something that you want to do for them, Personally, I plan to give my mother Stephen Webster barware because I think we both need to brighten up the bar. <laughs> I think, you know, um, to, to celebrate, and I should say again, because we are in shutdown and there's lots of ways to educate yourself and enjoy things, and hopefully this has given you a bit of insight into a fantastic designer, the Stephen Webster Company is a family-owned business. I don't know if we can get Asia to agree to be on camera, but as he said, his, his wife and his daughter, is, or his daughter are very involved with the business. Any chance? Will she do it? She's not even here. I don't know. Uh, we've lost her. Anyway, she's spectacularly gorgeous, so hit the Google. But um, I think that, you know, if you're looking for a business to support, another thing to call out is that you are donating 10% of all proceeds from any sales to the MIND organization, which works with mental health issues. I've put the address up on the podcast. And, you know, for those of you who are not having the best time 
you know, with this process, you are not alone and we very much, you know, support you. And hopefully as we're all collectively trying to work through this, I think, you know, we, we just want to shout out to a fantastic independent family business and jeweler and incredibly creative designer. Please, please, please enjoy the pieces on our site, try them out, but buy them from Stephen Webster because we don't sell. And um, we want you to also just, you know, experience what it's like to work with high jewelry that's really fun. So again, you know, the, there's a reason why you have this call out as the coolest designer and the rock star of designers. So if you've ever thought to yourself, I want something that's really high jewelry, that's incredibly beautifully crafted, but I'm not an old lady, I'm not an old man, I'm not boring, please look at the Stephen Webster site because it couldn't be farther from boring. I mean, they are so fun and unique and special. And as you've heard in the podcast, they, they all have an incredible story or an incredible stone or both. And, you know, you've got a living designer who's contributing a spectacular work. So I can't thank you enough. I could have talked to you for hours and hours. And now that I'm a little blitzed at one in the afternoon. I think it was. I think it was. But we're allowed outside now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, we've ended COVID. We talked so long. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And it's been really a lot of fun talking to you and whoever is uh, watching or listening. Thank oh, you. it was a joy. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Cheers to you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Really, really enjoyed it. Cheers. Thank you.